Good evening. My name is Ron Anderson, and as you might infer from the way that I dress, the way that I speak, and in fact, the very fact that I stand in front of you here tonight, I'm a privileged, affluent, middle-aged white guy from the suburbs. Now, I've spent my entire career in the field of higher education, including, as Debbie said, four years as president of Century College here in Matamidi. And it's from both this personal and this professional uh, perspective that I'm speaking with you tonight. Now, there was a time when I defined myself as a person of Nordic descent. My father is Finnish, my mother is Norwegian, and much of who I am comes from those cultures and those traditions, the expectations of those cultures, my family, and my community. But up until, or up recently, I've begun to think about myself and to see myself differently. I'm beginning to look beyond my ethnicity and understand myself as a white man. So you might be asking, why does that matter? What does being white have to do with anything? Well, why it matters, in fact, why it's critically important, is because the influence of my race on the opportunities that I've had and how I engage the world is core to who I am, but I didn't know it. I didn't know it. See, I used to strive to see no color because that's what I thought good people do. I grew up thinking and believing that good people don't judge other people by the color of their skin. Now, I didn't think that the opportunities that I'd had were particularly unique or can, you know, had anything to do, frankly, with my race. And I certainly didn't question them. I didn't recognize them as privilege. But through my work in higher education over the last 20 years, I've come to understand that this just isn't true. Color matters in America. Color matters a great deal. Now, I've come to see that under, excuse me, I've come to understand that seeing color isn't about judgment, it's about understanding. It's about respecting the perspectives and the lived experiences of people who have had different experiences than I have. And what I didn't understand was that striving to see no color meant that I also didn't see mine. I didn't see me. I didn't see that I've had opportunity and success because of where I live and the doors that have been opened to me by virtue of me being part of the majority culture. I've had the privilege of not needing to grapple with my racial identity. I've had the privilege of not even having this in my line of sight until now. Now, I used to think that I couldn't, in fact, I shouldn't talk about racism as a white man. Who am I to talk about something I've never experienced? I didn't see this as mine to address. This wasn't white guy's work, right? Well, it wasn't until I became president of Century College that I realized that I can speak out. In fact, I must speak out about racism and inequity. And I must speak out because I have power. And with that power comes responsibility. As a leader in higher education and in my community, I've spent much of the last decade struggling to understand the experiences of our students in schools, colleges, and universities, and looking at the differential outcomes that we see for our different students, often based on the color of their skin, on the neighborhoods in which they live, on the wealth of their family, or their gender identity or expression. Now, for years, you've probably been hearing about the gaps that we see in opportunity and success in our K-12 system. Here in Minnesota, for example, in 2015, the graduation rate for our white students was 87%. For our black students, the rate was 62%, a full 25 percentage points lower than for our white students. And for American Indian students, the rate dropped to 52%. Why aren't we outraged by this? Now, not surprisingly, the alarming gaps persist into college and they remain highly predictable based on social and economic conditions. Nationally, gaps in bachelor's degree graduation rates consistently span more than 20 percentage points, with African American and American Indian students falling farthest behind the white students and Asian students. And the picture is even more bleak when we're looking at two-year associate degree graduation rates. Recent statistics from the U.S. Department of Education show gaps ranging up to 34 percentage points for students of color and American Indian students. Well, as I've worked with my colleagues to develop pilot projects and innovative programs that we hope will eliminate these educational disparities, we've struggled, and we've struggled mightily. The results of our work has been uneven and insufficient. 
as we've been building and focusing on what we do, building on what we know, and working within the historic structures of higher education. Alarmingly, there's emerging research that is showing that often it's our very structures and our cultures that impede the success of our non-majority students. Failing to recognize the different lived experiences of our students, specifically those students whose lived experience, experiences are marred by racism, discrimination, and intolerance, perpetuates and threatens to actually widen the education disparities. We're seeing that policy and programming alone are simply insufficient to eliminate disparities. In fact, it may be less about our strategies and interventions than it is about how we understand and work with those from whom we differ. While we've been treating the symptoms of disparity, we fail to adequately address its root cause. Our systems and our structures were designed to serve white, primarily middle-class Americans like myself, who have had access and opportunity and privilege simply by virtue of our birth. We have been so focused on better preparing today's students for our institutions that we've lost sight of the need for us to prepare our institutions for today's students. So by now you might be wondering, what does this have to do with tonight's theme of digging in? Well, as I was thinking about the theme over the last few months and thinking about my work and the issues that are facing us as a community, it struck me that the concept of digging in can really cut two different ways. On the one hand, we can dig in as in digging in our heels on an issue or a perspective. This way of digging in shuts out meaningful conversation and it is closed to reflection and modification. I think this polarizing approach is one that we are seeing far too often in our current civic dialogue and in our national political discourse. Now, on the other hand, we can dig into an issue or a perspective in the sense of really rolling up our sleeves and working hard to explore, engage, and understand that issue from a variety of perspectives. As I was considering these different ways of digging in, I was reflecting on my career and I realized that over the span of my career, I've had to learn how to dig in. In fact, I've learned to do that really well. I've learned how to deepen and widen the trench of my influence and privilege, the trench of my power and authority. I've learned how to strengthen the structures within which I work and live. In my field, this has been viewed as a positive trait. It's a good career move. It's a responsible way to behave in the profession and in the community. But I realize that in digging in, I and my colleagues and neighbors have created trenches Trenches that surround us, trenches that are often based on ideology that's hostile to compromise. We've created bunkers that separate us from those who don't share our background, our belief, or our experiences. We've built bunkers that have made it easy for us to figuratively toss grenades at one another while remaining protected. We've built bunkers that separate and maintain the way things are in our efforts to protect ourselves telling ourselves that we're just doing the right thing. And far too often, we've stopped listening. We've stopped genuinely engaging one another, even those within our own bunkers. I am so dug into my trench that I can't even see over the side by myself. To see outside my trench, I have to stand on the shoulders of my black sisters, on the shoulders of my trans brothers, and on the shoulders of families that are living in poverty. For it is only on standing on their shoulders that I am able to see over the edge and understand that the bunker that I have helped to create and that I have worked so tirelessly to shore up and support is separating us. These bunkers are not supporting our students. They are not providing the opportunities that our students need and our students deserve. And they are keeping us from addressing the disparities that face our state and frankly face our nation. It is time for us, for all of us, to stop our current way of digging in and first begin to dig out. Now, I can't speak to the lived experiences of those who are oppressed, of those who are discriminated against, those that are suffering daily the consequences of inequity. I've come to understand that's not my role. But what I can speak to is the perspective of one whose lived experience is out of affluence and privilege, that of authority and power the perspective of one who intentionally or not has been complicit in perpetuating a culture and a system that advantages people like me. 
I can speak. And as I mentioned earlier, I believe I must speak because of the positions that I hold and the authority and the power that accompanies my roles. Now, addressing oppression, discrimination, racism, and social injustice is, in fact, white guys' work. In fact, this is my work, and I would suggest that it's yours as well. It's time for me and for all of us to start digging out, digging out of the trenches that we've created that separate us from one another, those trenches that have protected us from the many difficult realities and discussions that we simply don't wish to face, the trenches that have done so very well exactly what they were designed to do. That is to maintain existing structures, maintain the safety and the integrity of the experience of those that are within the trench. The problem is our trench is small and it's exclusive. And while we may be thriving within our trench, those outside are often dying, too often today, quite literally. So I invite you tonight to join me in digging out, in digging out of our current structures, our current frameworks, and our current ways of thinking. Then together, let's begin digging in again anew, digging into the difficult discussions that we have to have to the expanding, expanded understanding of those whose lived experiences are different from ours, and to the dismantling of the structures that separate opportunity, success, and access. In the days ahead, I encourage you to make time to talk to your friends, family, and your colleagues about race and your own racial identity. Make time to reflect on the experiences and the opportunities that you've had. Ask yourself, what role did my race or my social class or my gender play in making that experience possible? And equally important, make time to listen. Suspend your judgment and purely listen. Listen for understanding of difference in lived experiences. Listen, reflect, talk some more. Challenge your, your assumptions and be willing to sit in discomfort. This isn't easy work, and it isn't the work of a day, a week, or even a year. Now, we didn't create the systems that currently exist, the systems that perpetuate disparities that we see, disparities that have been decades, sometimes even centuries in the making. But we do have a choice. We can continue to maintain these systems or we can transform them. What will you choose? <laughs>